Welcome to part three of this five-part series called Creating the Perfect Value Stream. And uh, if you haven't seen parts one and two, uh, I'd recommend that you click on the link on this page and go back and view those. We're trying to keep these relatively short, each one of these parts. Now, this is going to be a hard one to keep to 10 minutes because on this subject, uh, actually designing the perfect value stream, the methodology, we've written a whole book. I think we showed this to you the other day, The Complete Guide to Mixed Model Line Design. And we teach a three-day class uh, with our partners, Toyota Material Handling, on the same subject. And we're actually coming up, we're developing currently an advanced mixed model line design class for all the things that we don't have time to talk about in the, uh, the first three-day class. So there's a lot to talk about, and I'm going to try to keep this to 10 minutes, so I better stop introducing and get to it right away. Now, Jim Womack from the Lean Design Institute a few years ago made a comment that one of the reasons why there seems to be in some companies a lot of Kaizen, a lot of Kaizen events, uh, is that most likely the processes that they're addressing weren't designed properly to begin with. So if you design the process or the value stream properly at the beginning, why would you need these major Kaizens? You shouldn't. Now, ongoing small changes, yes, continually. And those require engagement from, from everyone. But big changes, why would those even be needed? So that's the issue. So we're going to go through the methodology in this lesson of how to design that stream, that value stream, but in a very accelerated way. I hope you understand and forgive me for that. So let's let's start uh, at the beginning. Uh, we're assuming that you have a goal, you have a plan, you have a target area. Uh, those are prerequisites you know, before we get started. So you know what area you want to improve, what value stream we're focused on. And uh, let's go through the actual discrete steps that you uh, would need to take to design this perfect value stream. So step one, and you can read about this in more detail below on this page. So step one is define your products. Now the products don't have to be physical products, they could be services, but we are designing this value stream to process some entities. You know, at the end could be a service or, or a physical product, but we need to have a list of those and we really need to document anything, any entity that's going to be processed through that value stream. So if we're talking about products, we need to think about things like, do we have sister plants that we supply to? Uh, maybe not going to an end customer, but to a, another factory within our company. Or do we process spare parts on that same value stream, you know, using the same resources? So those are the kinds of products that we're talking about that we need to document. Typically, we would have a part number or, uh, or some kind of description of those entities. And just maybe think of it, an Excel spreadsheet. And we're creating, we're building one. And column A, the first column would be a list of all the products that we need to include in this line. And you'll notice that the title of our book is Mixed Model Manufacturing. So we're assuming here that we're building a variety of different products. They have to be pretty similar but different products, different models, different sizes within that same family on the same production line and be able to mix them efficiently. So that's step one. Step two, set the volumes. So for each one of these products, we need to have some idea of how many on average, right, per day. And if you add up all the volumes for all the products, that will give you the total capacity of this line. So in a given day, what is the demand on average? It doesn't have to be a whole number. It could be a fraction but what is the demand for each one of these products? And you add it all up and that's the total capacity. And by the way, how do we get that number? How do you, how do you know what that is? Well, you'd have, probably have to be looking at past history, but also talk to sales and marketing because we're trying to develop here a forecast. We're not talking about what we did in the past. We're more concerned with where we're going in the future. And presumably sales and marketing are the people that will help you do that. Next, so we have a list of products. We have volumes that we're gonna design to. So we're going to design the line to meet, be able to build those volumes. So the third step is document the processes. So we're going to ask you to create a simplified value stream map. We call that a process flow diagram for every one of those products. Now, they don't have, all have to be different, but we want a simplified flow chart of each one of the products. So you have a process name, you have an arrow, process name, arrow. So from left to right, you can kind of see how you build each of those products. Okay, with me so far? So far, so good. And so far, this doesn't take too long. We're going to get to some steps that are a lot more time consuming. So step number four, take that process flow diagram information and create a matrix. So continue building on your Excel spreadsheet, if you like. And across the top, you've got the products. Remember, you have the volumes. 
And now start adding the processes that you documented on the process flow diagrams across the top in the spreadsheet in the order of flow as best you can. So the one on the end on the far right would be the last process and so on and so forth. Great. So process flow matrix. Now take your process flow diagrams and put an X in that intersection of product and process if that product requires that process. And you're going to, just by looking at this matrix, see pretty clearly the level of process commonality. For example, if you had perfect process commonality, there'd be an X in every single cell. But that's not necessary. You just want to be reasonably close. And so doing this matrix will allow you to, uh, one of the many good things about this matrix is allow you to see the level of process commonality. Uh, visually, you can just look at it and see if you have certain products that maybe aren't good fits for this family because the processes are too different. Make a copy of your matrix, get an Excel, you know, right click, copy, and replace every X that you had in that matrix with a time. And what we're looking for here is the work content time, the time it takes to do the work for that product and that process, the total time. Now, if you don't have those total times, you're going to need to get those total times and therein lies the effort. So go ahead and uh, replace every X with a time. So now you have a new matrix, the process time matrix. The name we, we give for the other matrix, the X is the X chart or X matrix. Now we're ready to, uh, we're almost ready <laughs> to do some calculations. We're going to analyze this data. So down at the bottom of your, your sheet, add a, add a row uh, titled effective work minutes. And what we want to have here for every process is how many minutes in a day in a 24 hour period are available to actually work in that process. So clearly if everyone leaves and goes to lunch, that time is not included. And if you're only working two shifts, then the third shift time is not included. Or if you have breaks, or if you have um, uh, startup meetings in the morning or cleanup at the end of the shift, those times are taken out. And what's remaining is the time available to do work in that process, you know, where someone is there doing work. So two calculations. We're going to calculate something called tack time, German word that means rhythm or beat. So for every process, what's the rate that process need, or the speed that that process needs to run in order to meet this demand right, that we defined? So tack time formula is very, very simple. We take the effective work minutes. So you just entered that, right? And we divide that by the volume. So we take the effective work minutes divided by the volume. That gives us a tack time usually expressed in minutes. So it's minutes per unit. How long should it take one unit to get through the system? And how many minutes do we have in a day? Divide that total day by the number of minutes. This is just the reverse tack time formula. That'll tell us uh, how many units we're going to finish in that day. Next thing, and probably more important than tack time, is uh, resources. So for every one of these processes, how many people do I need? How many machines do I need? I need to calculate that. We're not just guessing. We're not just putting people in there. So again, very simple formula. We take the standard time, average standard time, or if, you, if the times are different, because you have different products, calculate the weighted average. Now, weighted average is sixth grade or, you know, sixth grade math, so it shouldn't be too hard. But weighted average, use the volumes as the weighting factor. So weighted average, time to do the work, divided by the tack time. And leave a couple decimal places. And that will give you an idea of how many people, how many machines. Now, if you have different resources in a process, like you have machines and people, or if you have two different labor categories, you're going to need to split this out and have separate columns for each different resource category and calculate those resources separately. But the formula is the same. Standard time weighted divided by the tack time. But um, you're going to need to decide, for example, things like, do, do we do the work like a, an assembly line or can we do it or do we have to do it in parallel? For example, a test would be a process that normally you'd have to do in parallel. I can't stop the test and then move it to the next test machine that kind of situation. So you're going to need to think about that. Buffers, how do things connect it? What's, what is the signaling? All those good discussions need to be done at the conceptual level with post-it notes, kind of like this, right? Just lay these out and write the resource on it, workstation five, and just lay them out on a table and have that discussion. If you don't do that and you just try to fire up CAD, you're going to be wasting a lot of time because there are a lot of discussions that need to happen prior to your being able to do that. What we're going to do next is create a block layout. I know there's a temptation to jump right to CAD, 
but we're not going to do that. We're going to develop a block layout and put down the post-it notes. Use, use post-it notes so you can move them around and lay out the flow, how things are connected based on your process flow diagrams and based on your knowledge of the products. You're going to need to make some decisions. You can see those in the report down below. Next step, line balancing. So if you have a product uh, and a process that you're building like an, ass an assembly line, where you're breaking the work into pieces, kind of like Henry Ford's Model T Ford, uh, you're going to need to allocate pieces of the work to individual workstations. And we call that line balancing or level loading the work. And this is, this is a step that's critically important and can take quite a bit of time to do this correctly. You're trying to evenly spread the work across however many stations uh, you calculated for that process. So, you know, workstation 10 or the first one does steps uh, 10 through 80 and next one does 90 through 120, et cetera, et cetera. And try to, when you add up the times, try to get those times as even as possible. So in the next lesson, the next part four, I'm going to talk about kind of take, take off from where we left it here. Uh, how do we bring this line design live, you know, physically live, and then how do we manage it? Uh, critically important point. Once we have it, how do we actually run this mixed model line uh, to actually get the benefits of this ultimate value stream? Okay, so we'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye.